<laughs> so to our second BYOB book chat. Uh, we've got, I believe, six librarians here tonight to tell you about some books that we've read recently and enjoyed that we think you might like too. Um, talking tonight, we've got Amy, Beth, myself, Kathy, Chris, Josh, and Tom. Um, and so we're just going to tell you the first half of this. We'll tell you what we're reading. And then if you want to type into the chat and tell us what you're reading, we're going to talk about those at the end. So I'm going to start us off. My first book is called Sadie by Courtney Summers. And I've just been obsessed with this book since I read it last year. I've been telling everyone about it. Um, it was kind of marketed as a young adult novel, which it is, but I think it's also really enjoyable for adults. Um, so the basic story is, um, it's kind of dark. So Sadie's sister was murdered. Um, she's a teenager and her sister was like her whole world and she was kind of her protector and she was very, very close to her. So she goes on this mission to find out what happened to her sister. And she, it's basically a road trip across the US and she finds all these different clues and that takes her to the next person who might know something. And then the second part of the story is um, there's another person who's following her who's making a podcast about it. So if you're into podcasts, this might be something that interests you. And so each step of the way, he's kind of right behind her and he's finding out what the full story is. Um, so I really recommend listening to this on audio. Um, it's really, really well done. And it's very like, I think I listened to the whole thing in two days because you're just like, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? Um, it's a really, really good book. Uh, it's called Sadie by Courtney Summers. <laughs> and this is Amy. Hi, everyone. Um, so I am, my brain is full and I cannot accept any new content anymore. So I'm like, watching all my old shows again. I'm re-watching some of my favorites. I'm rereading books that I've loved. Um, and this is one of them, The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver. So this is a book that came out in the 90s. So it's kind of an older one, but um, it's just a really, really compelling narrative. It takes place in the Belgian Congo where this um, evangelist preacher kind of um, moves his family without checking with any of the locals and without checking with his church back in the American South. And so he's there with his wife and I think four daughters. Um, and the really cool thing about this is even though the main character in the book is a man, it's told from the perspective of the women of his life. And so um, they're in the Congo, Congolese jungle. And um, at the time, I think Congo was fighting a revolutionary war against Belgium. And so it's got this really um, historic backdrop that takes place in the 50s. Um, and so there's like all of these, this political content about what's going on in Congo at the time. And it's also got this element of this preacher who is a really unlikable character, um, but his daughters and his wife are struggling, you know, they have their own struggles, they have their own character aspects. Um, so this is one that is super character driven. It's, uh, but it's also got a really great plot. And it just, for me, it was an absolute page turner. Um, and so was, when I was thinking about revisiting some old books that I love, this is one that always comes up at the top of my mind. And Barbara, Barbara Kingsolver, I think is kind of an American classic, uh, you know, she, I mean, she's still writing, she's still publishing. Um, this is a great one for if you liked, uh, like State of Wonder by Ann Patchett. It's got this kind of rich narrative with um, really, really interesting characters, a lot of character development, and uh, just a great story all around. So this was The Poisonwood Bible by Barbara Kingsolver. I had to read that one in high school, and I just loved it. And I also reread it a few years back. I think it's I, I didn't have to read it in high school. I think we read The Bean Trees, which I don't think I actually read in high school because I reread it as an adult and I just loved it. I was one of those like kind of angsty teens that never, you know, like every time a book was assigned to us, it's like, oh my God, that book probably sucks. And I was wrong. All right. Okay, this is my book. This is Beth talking. Um, sorry, you can't see me if you're looking at the videos. So this book is really written by Heidi Cullinan. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right. Heidi is a straight female and this book is a gay romance, uh, male, male gay romance. There are different perspectives on 
whether that's appropriate or how that's appropriate or whatever, but putting all of that aside, this is the first book in a series of three, and I simply loved it. it it's just straight up romance. It's, you know, two people who meet and fall for each other and there's conflict and tension and obstacles to overcome and I don't think I'm giving anything away by saying a happy ending. Um, so it's set in some small town, I can't remember, either Wisconsin or Minnesota. Um, the, the three main characters, well, the, the book is set around these three um, gay men who have been best friends since middle school and who all live in this small town and work in this one hospital. One is a nurse, one is a pediatrician, and one is an anesthesiologist. And then these are sort of their three stories. Um, but it's just, it's just straight up romance and it's wonderful. I absolutely loved it as, you know, just a little bit of happiness in your life. All right, this is Josh and I've got, but what if we're wrong? Uh, Chuck Klosterman goes through um, different genres about things that we have kind of feel in our 21st century Western culture, like we've got it, we've made it, we've got it. <clears throat> um, we finally have the right ways of getting either the truth or the best ways of thinking about things. And he goes and says, well, on other time periods, Western society has thought we got it. What happens if we look at our, our near future as if it were our distant past. Um, I always like to have like the um, thought experiments about what is actually going to last in 200 years or what do we think right now um, as science or whatever that will be shown to be wrong in 300 years. Uh, even that goes into music, which is a, if you're uh, if you're interested in the history of music, specifically rock and roll, uh, he's got a whole chapter devoted to that. Like, what's the epitome of rock and roll? Is it the Beatles? Is it Chuck Berry? How do we how do we decide what the sound is? Um, what do critics? What's what's the difference between the critics and what popular opinion is when it comes to things that will last? Uh, he looks at Moby Dick, who at the time, Melville was a total washout. Nobody liked his book. He didn't make any money for it. And people ignored it for a while until circumstances changed and somebody brought it up. And now we all hear it in our common culture as oh, that is an important piece of American literature. How does that happen? So this book is on Hoopla. I listened to it. Um, and he had one of his um, one of his editors read it. Um, she's a great narrator. And uh, when it comes to the science section, he likes to look at um, a couple of big public scientists, including Neil deGrasse Tyson, who says the thing thinking about science really hasn't changed since the 1600s because in the 1600s. There was a major revolution in mathematics and hard sciences and um, biology studies. So that's what this whole book is about. And one of my escapisms is going into like these intense kind of ridiculous scenarios and playing around with them. And I just want to say the cover is correct in the slide mm -hmm. here. It yeah, 100%. Really that's not a formatting error. Nope. That's, and that's a good case in point. All right, thank you, Josh. Okay, it is my turn. This is Tom. Uh, my wheelhouse is predominantly youth books, but believe me, I definitely love making time for young adult and adult books. And first up is a young adult book, Dorothy Must Die by Daniel Page, published in 2014. High schooler Amy is from Kansas and leads a ho-hum life, not really going anywhere. But when a tornado whisks her away, she too, like Dorothy, ends up in Oz. But it's not like the world she's heard or read about. Time has passed and Dorothy has returned to Oz as a crazed ruler, siphoning magic from the land. The Scarecrow, the Lion, and Tin Man are all altered by Dorothy's madness and lust for power. 
Amy finds herself amidst a revolution to overthrow Dorothy and kill her. Of all the people she's teaming up with, it's the Wicked Witches of Oz. And they've had enough of Dorothy, hence Dorothy must die. The style of the writing was fine. I understand sometimes words are in italics for emphasis, but I thought it was overdone. The book was divided into uh, four great parts. Amy's life in Kansas, her wanderings in Oz, her recruitment by the Wicked Witches, and then her mission to overthrow Dorothy. There are three books that follow this, The Wicked Will Rise, Yellow Brick War, and The End of Oz. The author has also written nine e-novellas that take place before the first book, and I highly recommend it. I don't want to piggyback on that. It's, um, it's not officially connected, but if you read Wicked, this is like the uh, next step in a way. It's great. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Chris, you're muted. Here I come unmute. Hey, okay. <laughs> Um, yes, I'm Chris. Um, this book is called Unmarriageable, and her subtitle is Pride and Prejudice in Pakistan. And uh, it is uh, an, an adaption of Pride and Prejudice, and a pretty faithful adaption in terms of the characters and the even scene by scene. Uh, and it's, it's witty and very funny, and uh, is kind of an amazing glimpse into everyday life in Pakistan. Um, there's a family, of course, with five daughters, who, and the mother is very anxious about marrying them off. And um, so you, you see the, the angst of society, but with the different, lots of, lots of interesting cultural things, the clothes, the food, the um, marriage ceremonies they go to. And this two very, uh, five daughters, but the two eldest are very intelligent ladies who teach school and don't really want to get married. That is a little bit different from Pride and Prejudice. But um, yeah, the characters are fun. And so it's, it's, it's intelligent, witty, and um, escapist sort of fiction. But at the same time, you're sort of getting a window or a peek into a very different culture. Uh, another one that's similar to that would be maybe like the rich... Asian, what's the title of that? Crazy Rich Asians. Crazy Rich Asians, yeah. I love that one. It might be a little bit similar in that, that this kind of gossipy thing and funny, it's basically romantic comedy that Jane Austen was doing. Um, and also uh, Eligible by Curtis Sittenfeld is another one. I just don't think this one, Unmarriageable, was really noticed that much and I really enjoyed it. So. Well, Chris, I loved Eligible, <clears throat> and I oh. kind of read it by accident. I didn't yeah. realize that it was like a, a yeah. modern retelling of Pride and Prejudice until it's I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> until I was like, well into it and already committed. And I usually hate modern retellings of something like, um, what was that one with Joe Baker? And it was like the upstairs, downstairs. It was told from like the perspective of the ladies' maids, right. just ringing a bell. I, I did read it and I can't remember the title. <laughs> I hated that one. I thought it was so stupid. I thought it was, yeah. I just, I didn't like it. And then I read Eligible and I was like, okay, maybe modern retellings aren't so bad. Um, and yeah, was Pride and Prejudice is obviously <laughs> one of my favorites. And so I'm definitely going to put this one on my list. Yeah, it was, it was really touching and, and funny too. All right, well, I'm up next, and my book is Nothing to See Here by Kevin Wilson. And this was a book that I read that I was really surprised that I liked it because based on the description, I, I didn't even want to read it. <laughs> and then it kept showing up on all these best of 2019 lists, and people were telling me it was so great. So I was like, okay, I'll give it a try. Um, and the, the basic story is uh, there's two women who were friends in high school, and then many years later, um, their paths cross again. Um, so one of the women has married this bigwig politician guy, and she, she has um, become stepmom to his two children, and they have this issue where they burst into flames every once in a while. So if they get really anxious or um, something traumatic happens, they will just burst into flames, and they're totally fine, but they're a risk for like burning the house down and stuff like that. 
um, and she can't really handle it. So she calls her old high school friend to come and be their nanny. Um, and so there's a lot of humor and it's just written in a really kind of ridiculous way. But there's also a lot of character development and you get into this, you know, that something traumatic happened when they were younger and that kind of comes out and um, you really start to care about the kids and you can see the relationship developing between the nanny and the two kids. Um, and it's also a pretty quick read. It was, you know, I don't know, maybe 200 pages or something. Um, so that is Nothing to See Here by Kevin Wilson. It's so funny that you say that, Brenny, Brenna, because Susan read that book too. And when she was telling me about it, I was like, that does not sound like something that anybody <laughs> that I know would like. But I keep hearing the same thing. So maybe I'll, I'll have to read yeah, it. Yeah, give it a try. I was surprised. I, I really liked it in the end. She said that she listened to it and sh she said it was a great audio book. Okay, I did not listen to it. Yeah. Okay, back to me. This one is Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Um, Chris Voss is an international hostage negotiator for the FBI and so he decided to he has this new like consulting group or something um, but he decided to write a book about negotiating and this is another one that I've read multiple times I actually read it every time I know that I have a really stressful negotiation coming up like uh, you know um, when we are working with vendors at work or if I know that I'm going to have to, you know, sign a contract or something like this, I reread this book. It's about 200 pages. It's great. I actually took notes on this book. Um, and my coworkers will tell you that I can't stop talking about it because basically what he does is he takes all of these hostage negotiation tactics and he applies it to things in real life. And so he's got like four main ways that you negotiate and they're like labeling, mirroring, and I forget what the other two are because they I really use the, the, um, the first two. And so every time I have to, I know I'm going to be up for a really difficult negotiation. I reread this book or I listen to it and I take notes on it and I prepare for it in the way that he tells you to prepare. And there's one time I was, I had a really difficult confrontation coming up. I knew that it wasn't going to go well. And I read the book and I prepared for it. And I literally got everything I wanted out of it. And everybody walked away from the table feeling better. Like I got everything I wanted. And the other side walked away feeling like they had accomplished something too. It was, it was amazing. So um, this is one that I just kind of keep like, I should probably just buy it because I reread it so often and I just get so much out of it every time I read it. So this is Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. Maybe you're in the wrong profession. Maybe you need to be in the FBI or something. I would love to be in the FBI. They actually recruited, the FBI and the CIA recruited at my library school. Um, like they would come in and talk to us. Yeah, because it was uh, like, I'm probably like the only public librarian that ever came out of that program. It was super like information science focused. Um, so they'd come and talk to our classes and they'd, they'd like recruit, but they'd be like, oh, uh, get another job because the background check takes two years. Oh, wow. So I don't know. That would be a really cool job, though. Maybe I'll think about it. I used it for uh, my rent negotiation. So, and Did you read it, Josh? Oh, yeah. Yep. That is on my Did you have the same feeling about it when you were done? Like you could just do anything? Pretty much. Yep. It was, yeah, yeah, yeah it was definitely, um, you can, you can also read it from, from the other way of like typically what throws people off or what makes a, a negotiation bad. And so I even had like those expectations for this is what you wait for when something is going to go poorly. And I'm like, oh, that's what's happening. So then I could use his tactic about saying, okay, let's try to yeah. read. Yeah. And he's got all these like crazy tactics, like starting with no. And like, he's got this whole chapter on how like no is the best thing in a negotiation. It's like the best word. You shouldn't be afraid of it. And then he's got like this thing on tactical empathy and listening. And it's just, it's amazing. Everybody should read it. Okay, this is my book again. Um, nonfiction. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Trevor, Trevor Noah is the um, person who took Jon Stewart's place as the host of The Daily Show. Um, I don't remember what channel it's on. 
but uh, Trevor Noah was um, born in South Africa and he was born uh, when apartheid was still in place in South Africa. He has a, um, his mother is black, his father is white. And so he was literally under apartheid laws. He, his existence was a crime. Now this book is um, a very easy read. It is not deep and dark and heavy, but it is very much about his life. Now he's a comedian, um, so he puts a lot of humor into it and it's more or less chronological. Um, his uh, father, his mother raised him um, as a single mom and he didn't really have much of any connection to his father for quite some time. He does now as an adult, but it, it's absolutely set in South Africa. It gives a wonderful little view snapshot, kind of as Chris was saying before, a, lo a lovely little snapshot into a different culture. One of the things I really like about this book is at the beginning of each chapter, he takes a page to kind of give you some either historical or cultural background so you can then put what he's about to tell you into context, um, which I really appreciated because, you know, obviously I did not grow up in South Africa and I don't really know much about the culture there. And so he'd start to tell a story um, and, and this has happened when I've read books set in other locations. I'm reading through it and I know I'm missing stuff, right? I know I'm missing what's in between the lines. And it was really nice that he would sort of set you up in front of each chapter so that you didn't necessarily feel that way. And it's just fascinating. It, it's fascinating, um, his story and the things that he went through and his perspective and then coming to America and his perspective as an outsider on America. And it's just, as I say, it's a fairly light, easy read. It's a wonderful glimpse into another culture, obviously through his particular eyes as well. Um, and I just really enjoy him as the host on The Daily Show. I think he's got a great perspective on things. And it's, I just really enjoyed the book. It was one of the easiest nonfiction biography books I've ever read. And Liz is saying it was one of her favorite reads of 2019. That's awesome. It's a great book. He's a great guy and it's a great book. All right, I'm up. I'm Kathy and Carnegie's made. Yes, that Carnegie. Uh, Andrew Carnegie of Car Carnegie Hall. I keep saying it wrong. Carnegie Museum, all the Carnegie libraries that he helped build around the world, more than 3,000. But he was also an industrialist, one of the richest men of his time, had a reputation as a shrewd businessman and a tycoon. He was an inside trader, not the most perfect person, uh, but he ended up being an amazing philanthropist and gave away 90% of his wealth by the end of his life. And how did that transformation happen? And that's what Marie Benedict um, tries to answer in her historical fiction novel. At the beginning of the book, she writes a letter to the reader and she says, I've always wondered about Carnegie and he was rumored to be this heartless tycoon and how did he become this philanthropist? How, where, where, where did this metamorphosis come from? And so that's the seed that she uses to sprout her, her novel. Um, and it begins with a case of mistaken identity. It's 1863, two young women from Ireland, both named Clara Kelly, are on a ship headed to America. One's in second class, one's in steerage. And the young Clara Kelly in second class unfortunately passes away before the ship reaches America. And when the ship reaches America, the steerage Clara Kelly, a farmer's daughter from Galway, hears someone calling her name. And she answers, the call was actually for the other Clara Kelly, but the person who called her was standing in front of a coach that was headed to Pittsburgh. And Pittsburgh is where she wants to be. So she makes a split second decision to assume the identity of the other Clara. And 
Turns out that the other Clara had been headed to Pittsburgh in order to become a lady's maid for Margaret Carnegie, who was Andrew's mother. Um, but of course, she knows nothing about being a lady's maid. And only hours after she gets to Pittsburgh, she's already standing in the Carnegie's parlor. And the question is, is she going to be able to pull this off? How long is she going to be able to pull this off? What influence does she end up having, or does she, on Andrew Carnegie? Is this where the transformation into a philanthropist comes? And so I recommend reading it. It's historical fiction. There's a little bit of the star-crossed lover romance kind of tone to it. It's speculative. You know, how did this happen to Carnegie? Um, if you like historical fiction, you'll probably like it. She's also the author of The Other Einstein, which is a story about Albert Einstein's first wife. So it was a good book. That one's also a big hit with the book clubs, if you're looking for book club books. Okay. This is a brand new book from this year. It's a good blend of romance. It's got insightful navel gazing and philosophizing in it. <laughs> and it's got a bunch of running around hijinks. Um, McFarlane follow, writes about an early 30s British lawyer whose boyfriend since high school blindsides her with the classic, it's not you, it's me. Um, dating in the world of Tinder for 30 somethings is terrifying. She's not going to like, she's, um, but she's not going to take what happens to her or life in general laying down. I did say she was an attorney and yes, her live-in boyfriend um, who walked out on her also works at that firm. Um, and so what she do? She, some hijinks occur that are kind of ridiculous, but um, McFarlane makes it work. And she kind of hooks up with one of the um, attorneys who has the hotshot bad boy devil may care attitude, who's got the warm heart cliche that works very well. Um, to pretty much make all of their gossiping chatterbug colleagues both impressed and jealous. Um, and then of course the question comes up, um, what happens if you can't tell if this thing that was fake that you're having fun with becomes real and if you acknowledge that it becomes real, does it ruin it? Um, it's a great fun read. Um, I say read, but I listened to audiobook on Hoopla. The author has a British accent, um, and they are in Britain, so that kind of gives a, you know, any any sort of Anglophiles that probably a lot of us are, they're going to have real fun with it. Um, and it is, it kind of took me by surprise. It's got a decent bit of accolades. Like I said, it's brand new. And uh, the, the world building doesn't take a lot because it's kind of how you would imagine things. And like I said, there, there are some cliches and McFarland does a great job playing with them. Uh, so this is the book I'm listening to actually right now. I'm like this far from the end. Yay, okay. Uh, it is my turn again. Okay, so uh, this is the, the Best American Science Fiction and Fantasy of 2015, editor Joe Hill and series editor John Joseph Adams. So I forget about short stories at times and thus reminded why I need to revisit them more and more. For those who aren't into fantasy or science fiction, I get it, sort of. But I challenge you, a short story of either of these genres are a perfect way to get into them if you're not familiar with fantasy or sci-fi. At about 350 pages, 19 stories, that's about 18 pages for a story that is so palatable to give these a try. And they do really run the gamut. I'll focus on three of them. In Carmen Maria Machado's Help Me Follow My Sister Into the Land of the Dead, the main character Ursula funds a Kickstarter and details why she needs funds to go to the land of the dead to rescue her sister. In the Relive Box by T.C. Boyle, a father and daughter fight over whose turn is it to use the Relive Box. It's technology that ties into the brain 
and projects any point in your life to see in front of you in 3D holograms. How much is too much though when you relive the past and you forget the present? And then in Daniel H. Wilson, he wrote the blue afternoon that lasted forever. I'm gonna read you one short paragraph. The cafeteria where I work plays the news during lunch. The television is muted, but I watch it anyway. My plastic fork is halfway to my mouth when I see the eyewitness video accompany the latest breaking news story. After that, I am not very aware of what is happening, except that I am running. The narrator is a physicist, thus he's knowledgeable of stellar occurrences that happen in our universe. But by looking at the TV for one instant, he recognizes one of these occurrences and he freaks out. It's a powerful story that's both beautiful and sad. And again, I, I really highly recommend this book. And again, if you're not into fantasy or sci-fi, just try one of these stories and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. Uh, the coroner's lunch. Um, so funny story. Um, my sister and I had just spent four wonderful days in Luang Prabang, which is in Laos. We were sitting in the itty bitty teeny tiny little airport uh, in Laos waiting for our plane and they had an even smaller itty or bitty or tiny little bookstore attached to the airport and we had a couple of hours to kill. So we went over thinking we probably wouldn't find any books in English anyway and sure enough they had this, they did have books in English and they had a series um, that was written, the author, Colin Catterill, he was actually born in 1952 in London. And as an adult, he, he traveled around teaching um, English and eventually training teachers, um, primarily in, in Asia, Southeast Asia. And so he wrote this, this uh, um, detective series. And the, de the detective is a Laotian detective. It is set in Laos. Um, if any of you know anything about Laos, this is a, a very Buddhist country. So um, it's a basic uh, detective series, mystery, generally murder mystery. At the time, there were six or seven books in the series. You can still find all of these books in the libraries, and obviously you can find it on Hoopla. Um, it's, as we've said a couple of times now, it's just this incredibly wonderful glimpse into another culture. The one itty bitty tiny criticism I might have of it is that um, there are times when there's a sort of an intractable problem and that intractable problem sort of gets mysteriously solved because Buddhism and there's no other reason or explanation given. So you kind of have to just let those little things go. But otherwise the main detective, he is a wonderful, wonderful older gentleman. The characters, the culture, the setting, it's just, it, it, it you if you've ever been to Laos it just you soak that up because it's so wonderful and from my itty bitty little tiny bit of experience very true um but just again just a wonderful sort of you know armchair way of traveling to another place and murder mystery is my favorite genre anyway so I always love that as the the basic plot twist um and as I said this is a series when I read it which was 2008-ish, uh, 9-ish, somewhere around there. There were already seven books in the series. Um, I read all of them. They're just, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. And, and the main character, there's just no way you can't like him. He's just this wonderful, wonderful old Laotian detective. And it's just a delightful, delightful series. Good. Hello. I'm unmuted now. Okay, so this is Molokai by Alan Brunner. Um, I, this is another book that I kind of read by accident. So um, I can't really remember why I picked it up. I was looking for really good audiobooks, and, um, you know, this was on one of the lists of, I think it was published in the early 2000s. And so this is on a list of really great audiobooks. But the interesting thing was when I went to try to find it, um, it was only available on cassette tape. And I like, I couldn't order it through interlibrary loan and it hadn't really made it onto um, 
onto any of our electronic platforms yet. And so I used my free Audible credit on Amazon to download it on Amazon because someone had digitized it that way. So that being said, it was worth the extra effort to listen to this book. Um, the narrator was incredible. Um, Alan Brenner is one of these uh, people who writes historical fiction so precisely that he spends like 10 years researching a book. So I think he spent like 10 years in the archives all over Hawaii to try to get enough research to write this book. Um, this is about Rachel Kalama, who as a young girl, I think she's maybe seven or eight, she contracts leprosy in the 1890s in, um, I think she lived in Honolulu, and she was shipped off to Molokai to the leper colony there. And it follows her throughout her entire life. The story takes place over her entire life. It is so richly researched. It's just this beautiful, I, I, I can't even, I mean, I was like crying by the end of it and I can't even, I'm like not a crier at all. So um, really, really great characters. The setting was exquisite. It was almost like reading a his, like a history textbook because it was so precise in, you know, like every 10 years, something new was happening in Hawaii at the time. And so um, I highly, highly recommend it. This is a really good one for um, people who like historical fiction, obviously rich characters, um, but an author that really, really, really wants to get it right when it comes to historical setting. He now has one called Daughter of Molokai that came out, I think, last year. Um, I haven't read it yet. I, I really am more of an audiobook listener, and I could not get over the narrator's, like, baby talk. She, there's, like, this crying baby at the beginning of the book and I just like I just can't I can't listen to this one and I have not had a chance to pick it up as a print book yet but um, it's on my list um the when I read this book I immediately just gobbled up everything else by Alan Alan Brenner and he's got one called Honolulu that also is kind of the same premise where it's a it's a character um who you, you start to pay attention to her from a very young age and it follows her over the course of her life against a changing backdrop in a in a U.S. territory and even before Hawaii became a U.S. territory as all of this kind of political stuff was happening. So highly recommend it. It's a really great one to reread. Um, as I said, I'm rereading all my favorites right now and this is, uh, this is one of them. So this is Molokai by Alan Brenner. Amy, would you compare it to James Michener? I don't know that I've read anything by James Michener. I think I'd have to ask the reader's advisory expert. I also haven't read anything by him. So <laughs> I, read his, I read his book about Hawaii and it was wonderful. It, it starts from like the formation of the island. With the volcanoes, <laughs> right, Chris? Goes yeah. through time and, and also about the leper colonies and so on. Yeah, And wonderful. the missionaries, yeah. Yeah. It's really good. Uh, and I just really love Hawaii. I love being there. I was actually there when quarantine started and had a really hard time getting home. So oh. um, I, I like to read books about Hawaii in the winter in Chicago because it's just kind of like this escape to, it's almost like another world there. So it's another reason I really liked it. Okay, this one's mine. I, every year she comes out with a new one and I talk to my co-workers about them all the time, but uh, this is the 13th, I think, in the series, and I think she's going to end it with one more book, and um, they're just kind of fun. Um, it's set in the late 1300s. Uh, the main character is was a knight and was deposed because he participated in a rebellion against the King Richard II, King Richard II was only um, 10 years old when he became king. And uh, so the, there was a rebellion of nobles against him and they, it didn't work. And so he was, um, he had his knighthood taken away, his lands, his fiance and his, his titles. And he ended up on the streets of London and uh, doing odd jobs and eventually uh, became what they called a tracker back then he became a detective then. so it's a kind of combination of genres of historical mystery as well as detective noir i think she calls it a, a medieval noir mystery and um, 
Yeah, so there's a lot of fun detail about the time period and his character is very noble. Um, and there's an element of um, sort of a mystical element in that of, of artifacts or um, religious artifacts showing up in, in the mysteries that he has to do something with to deal with them in a good way. Um, so there, that's enjoyable. Another series that is maybe similar to this that is current also is uh, Candace Robb's Owen Archer series. And that's also set in the 1300s. And Owen Archer is a, a former warrior and uh, was blinded in one eye, becomes a spy for the Archbishop of York. And those are, those are kind of fun too. They've, there's many of them as well. If you like medieval or if you like historical mystery with, as Beth was saying, with murder mysteries in them um, that involve, these ones also involve a lot of historical figures. So that's kind of fun to see them woven into it. Uh, one of them is in Canterbury and involves Geoffrey Chaucer, and they make it sound like it was part of the creating of the Canterbury Tales. You know? And uh, in the last one that I read, this one, Sword of Shadows, involves the sword of Arthur, and they, he goes up to Cornwall. He's asked by a treasure hunter to come with him because th this man thinks that he has some bead on where this might be found. They go to this castle, Tin Tagle which is rumored to have been a place that Arthur, King Arthur was, was uh, raised. And so it's a, it's a wonderful setting and kind of bleak and mysterious up there in Cornwall on the, on the coast. And there's some people that seem like maybe they were ghosts that were talking to him. And so, so anyway, they're kind of fun. That's Jerry Westerson, the, the um, Crispin Guest is the character's name, Crispin Guest. Medieval Noir Mysteries. All right, I'm up next. And before I go, I just want to remind any of our participants, um, if you'd like to tell us what you've been reading, you can do that in the chat now. We're going to read them out at the end, um, if you choose to, totally optional. So my next book is The Seven or Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna by Juliet Grames. And I actually just finished this one yesterday, so it's very fresh in my mind. So this is a really great work of historical fiction. So the main character, Stella, is born in Italy in the early 1900s, and it follows her entire life. So she moves to the United States when she's about 20, um, but the first half of the book is set in this rural mountainous area in Italy. And it's framed around um, kind of this family story that she's died or almost died seven or eight times. And so each chapter is um, one of those deaths. So like, for example, one time she tried to steal some egg, eggplant from a pan that was cooking and the oil spilled on her and she almost died from that. Um, and so some people might believe it's a ghost. Some people might say it's bad luck, but it kind of provides the frame for the story. Um, it's not a really fast moving book. There's a really strong sense of place. You really feel like you're in these olive orchards in Italy um, or in these, um, neighborhoods in Connecticut when they moved to the United States. And there's also a lot of family relationship. <clears throat> so especially between Stella and her sister, Tina, and the kind of struggles that they have over the years. Um, I also think this is a really good one for book clubs if you'd be interested in that kind of thing. Um, but any kind of fan of historical fiction, I think you would like this one. That is The Seven or Eight Deaths of Stella Fortuna by Juliet Grains. Rats and roaches live by competition under the law of supply and demand. It is the privilege of human beings to live under the laws of justice and mercy. It is impossible not to notice how little the proponents of the ideal competition have to say about honesty, which is fundamental to economic virtue, and how little they have to say about community, compassion, and mutual help. Uh, Wendell Berry, uh, was a fairly prolific writer, um, did a few short stories of fiction, but he's mainly known for his nonfiction. Um, and What Are People For is a fairly recent um, re, reprinting kind of edited edition of a lot of his essays from um, 
uh, from the 1980s and something even a little earlier. Um, what he does, uh, he does well. He's kind of, the, he's in the pantheon of weaving together kind of the human spirit um, and ecology. Um, so he touches on some commerce, he touches on farming, he touches on um, the technology that we have, kind of the, uh, you know, the trite way to ask uh, who owns who? Do you carry your phone as, or does your phone carry you around? And what he's writing about at the time, back, you know, like I said, early 80s, is kind of a creepy, um, has a creepy relevancy for questions we're asking now, not just in 2020, about what's, what screens and our technology, um, how, how are, they're changing our lives and how they're so central to our lives. But also, again, when we're asked, when we're looking at ourselves um, during this COVID and quarantine and saying, how do we make connections? How do we keep community? Um, we, know, we know now almost more than ever that our minds and our bodies are deeply connected and we can't just do this on our own. So a lot of what he's written in this book really has a strong echo that uh, are kind of perennial questions about our technology. Literally, how are we connected to the earth, to the things growing out there? And he's not a, he can get polemic on certain things um, when it comes, he, uh, like he gave up his writing position as a tenured professor and he went and lived out on a farm. That's how aggressive he was. So I think that he's also a good uh, dialogue partner in, in looking at where his blind sides when it comes to intersectionality. Um, whether it's feminism or race or um, some things that he just doesn't deal with. Uh, so again, if you're kind of looking for this kind of shaking you up and saying, what are people for? We seem to be replaced. And especially now that we're all in our little holes, it's really good to bring up these questions again. All right, that's all we have from the librarians, but I see we have a few comments here. So Patricia is asking for a reliable source for critiques of audiobooks. So one thing that I use, it's a magazine and also a website called Audiophile, and they have book reviews that are specific to audiobooks. Um, so they'll tell you about the narrator and all that kind of stuff. I also use Goodreads for all of my book reviews, but that's not spread out between audiobooks and not audiobooks. You might have to dig a little bit and find someone who's reviewing the audiobook specifically. Um, does anyone else have thoughts on that? I don't, I don't know about reviews. I mean, I tend to go to like um, the Audi Awards is like kind of a roundup of audiobooks from the previous year and they've got best of but they also have a lot of nominees in each category and so that's a really good idea or a good way to get um, kind of like build your audiobook list. I more more than like critique or reviews of audiobooks um, once you kind of start paying attention to audiobooks and you get to know some of the narrators like the the people who are kind of in the circuit and reading a lot of audiobooks and also producers. Um, I think that the quality of production and narration really follows their reputation. Um, my, my aunt is an audiobook producer in New York um, and she actually produced Never Split the Difference, which I didn't know until the end credits. Um, and everything, you know, I'm biased obviously, but everything that I've listened to by her has been excellent. Um, and so if you kind of start paying attention to who's it's kind of like following your favorite author, you know, I mean, um, if you really have an author and you read everything that they come out with, it's the same with um, audiobooks and, and uh, narrators and producers, I would say. And David says he's reading Born a Crime by Trevor Noah. That's good timing since we talked about that one. And Mrs. Lincoln's Dressmaker and Waiting for a Giver of Stars by Jojo Moyes. I read Giver of Stars pretty recently, and I, if you like historical fiction, that's a really good one. Um, and it's about the pack horse librarians of Tennessee, so library people might be interested in that. Um, Liz says she's reading The Rise of Wolf 8, witnessing the, Trump of the triumph of Yellowstone's underdog. Um, 
but not really feeling it, that's okay. And Bad Blood by John Kerry Rue, which um, for anybody who's interested, our library book club is meeting through Zoom on Thursday evening at seven. So if you've read Bad Blood, or if you haven't, and you'd like to come to a book discussion, you can come to that. Um, so yes, Liz, we are still meeting. And then Karen is reading Such a Fun Age by Kylie Reed from Access 360 about a young woman happy with her nanny job, but feeling pushed to find something more grown up. There's a lot of emphasis on racism and class structure. Yeah, I've heard really good things about that book, Karen. Anybody else have any last thoughts? When you go back to the um, critiques, I definitely look at the one stars, whether it's Amazon or Goodreads or wherever. Because sometimes I'm like, if somebody wrote, oh, this is kind of slow and it's a little too heady, then I'd be like, oh, I might like that. Yeah. So <laughs> combing, you know, reading reviews against the grain actually is very uh, fun or productive. And Patricia also says um, she's reading Lillian Boxfish, Boxfish Takes a Walk, which I haven't read, but I've heard wonderful things about that one. Well, this has been super fun. I think we need to do one on like podcasts or TV shows or, you know, whatever you've oh, been yeah. watching next. Yeah, everybody has so many good recommendations. Thank you for everyone who presented tonight. Yeah. And uh, hopefully we can do this again soon. Sounds good. Have a good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.